Welcome to this video for the chapter on graph-based SLAM. I'm Wolfram Burkhardt, and I'm providing this video together with Giorgio Grisetti and Cyril Stadmus. Hi, I am Giorgio Grisetti. In this tutorial, we will guide you to understand the fundamentals of SLAM that will enable your robot to build maps. This video lecture consists of three parts. In the first part, Wolfram will introduce you to the basics of graph-based SLAM. In the second part, Giorgio will explain you to solve the underlying least square problem. And in the third part, I will explain you on how to deal with errors in your data association. With this, I'm handing back to Wolfram. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Wolfram Burgard, and I'm going to talk today about the first part of this tutorial on postgraph based SLAM, taught together with Giorgio Grisetti and Cyril Stadmus. To build robots that can autonomously navigate through their environment, we need to answer a couple of questions. The first one being, what does the world look like? The second one, where am I in this environment? And the third one, where should I go? The first two questions are answered by modern SLAM systems, while the third questions are enabled by solutions to the SLAM problem. SLAM is called simultaneous localization and mapping. Here, localization means estimating the position and the heading or the pose of the robot. Mapping means building a map of the environment. And in SLAM, we need to do both at the very same time. Here you see an example of a robot navigating through its environment and building a map of the environment. Whenever the robot comes back to a place it has been to before, we see that there are corrections made to its trajectory and the map. This is basically what a SLAM process does. There are three traditional paradigms of, uh, for SLAM. The first one being the Kalman filter type of uh, approaches with the extended Kalman filter being the most predominant solution. The second one are approaches based on particle filters or Monte Carlo localization, which are fast SLAM, G-mapping, and Rao blackwellized particle filters. The third approach are the so-called least squares method, methods with graph SLAM as a predominant solution or bundle adjustment. Here in this tutorial, we're going to talk about the graph SLAM type of solutions. So what is graph SLAM? It is basically a least squares approach to solving the SLAM problem. In order to do this, we have to formulate the overall problem as a post graph. And in this post graph, we, as in every graph, we have nodes and edges. We, whenever the robot moves, we basically create nodes of the individual positions recorded at discrete points in time. The movements between these nodes correspond to edges that are so-called constraints between the nodes. They basically tell us what the relative pose of these two nodes should be. Obviously, because these are measurements, they are inherently uncertain. Whenever the robot gets back to a place it has been to before and observes this with its extra receptive sensor, LIDAR or a camera, then we generate additional edges or constraints between the corresponding poses. This gives us the so-called post graph. The overall idea is to use a graph to represent the overall problem with nodes corresponding to the pose of the robot at a given point in time and an edge between two nodes corresponding to a spatial constraint between the adjacent nodes. Graph-based SLAM basically means building a graph and finding a node configuration that minimizes the error introduced by the constraints. And how is the error formulated? So let's first talk about the state vector, which is basically the collection of all nodes in the graph. Once we have these nodes and the corresponding poses, we can calculate what we expect to perceive. On the other hand, we have real observations that are represented by the edges and relate the nodes with each other. The goal now is to find the node configuration that minimizes the error between the predicted 
and the real observations. So basically what we are doing is we are taking the state consisting of all the nodes and calculate the predicted measurements for every measurement that we have. And then we compare the every me predicted measurement with the real measurement. The error function basically being just the difference between the two. We assume that the measurement error has zero mean and is normally distributed and that we have a Gaussian error with information matrix omega i. The squared error of a measurement is a scalar and depends only on the state. EI of x is basically EI of x transpose omega i EI of x. The goal now is to find the state x star that minimizes the error given all the measurements. A typical solution to solve such an equation is to calculate the derivative of the error function and de determine its zeros. Unfortunately, this is a general, a general, in general, a complex problem for which no closed form solution exists, which means that we have to rely on numerical approaches to solve this equation. The first part was from was uh, telling you how to represent SLAM as an optimization problem. In the second part, we will investigate about the structure of this problem and how to solve it. Uh, we have to remind that uh, in the end, our ultimate goal is to calculate the configuration of the robot trajectory that is maximally consistent with the observation. This means that we would like to go from a situation like the one depicted on the top, top, top left uh, to the one depicted on the bottom right of this line. Uh, the entire minimization problem could be boiled down into a graph. The nodes of this graph represents the robot positions along the trajectory. In contrast, edges represents virtual, virtual measurements. Such virtual measurements between pairwise nodes might arise either from odometry measurements that directly estimate the relative position between two temporally consequent robot positions, or they can be estimated by registering uh, pairwise environmental measurements in order to find their maximum we recall that uh, registering environmental measurements such as scans would then return uh, a position of the sensor that uh, uh, of the two sensors that uh, results in the maximum alignment between the two clouds. From this relative position, we, then, we can then extract a measurement that we fit and we use to construct our optimization problem. Both uh, edges coming from the odometry and edges coming registration process have the same type, which is a relative pose. So we can treat them homogeneously. We recall that uh, uh, correctly estimating this virtual measurement is of crucial importance for an optimization problem, because otherwise the, uh, what we try to solve has no meaning, and so will be the resulting method we have. And so will tell us about. Now, uh, let's look a little bit uh, inside one of these virtual measurements. So, uh, we already said that a virtual measurement involves a relative position between two nodes. This slide illustrates a simplistic two process uh, graph optimization problem. Uh, the uh, blue dot and the blue circle represent respectively the measurement and its associated uh, uncertainty. Uh, we immediately see that we could solve this problem by bringing the node xj in the middle of the blue ellipsoid. Therefore, we would be zeroing the error vector. But in general, a SLAM problem contains many variables and many, uh, and many uh, uh, edges that do not agree with each other. However, finding the global configuration x star that uh, makes all edges uh, uh, minimizes the uh, square error norm all errors uh, would lead to a potential, to potentially the maximally consistent trajectory, at least in terms of the measurement that we put in the problem. Let's now look uh, uh, a little bit inside uh, one of these uh, uh, error functions, and we can distinguish uh, clearly two aspects. One aspect, which is the prediction, which is obtained by uh, 
calculating the relative displacement between the two poses. And the second aspect is the absolute measurement. We clearly see that uh, whenever the prediction, so the relative estimate between the two poses, is exactly the same as the measurement, then this error vector is zero. So this uh, tells us that uh, our optimization problem is at least for the well posed. Uh, we observe that uh, uh, the shape of the error function of the global cost function that we want to minimize is characterized by many quadratic problems. Such class of problems is well suited to be approached with uh, uh, iterative minimization methods that start from an uh, initial guess of the solution and iteratively refine it by applying a perturbation delta x. Such perturbation is obtained by constructing a, a local quadratic approximation of the original problem in the perturbation delta x. And then the, the perturbation itself is calculated by finding the minimum of this uh, uh, quadratic form, which is the multi-dimensional ext um, uh, extension of a uh, second uh, degree polynomial. Uh, in this uh, slide, we summarize uh, uh, one iteration of the minimization algorithm. We can easily uh, see that uh, the goal is to, of one iteration is to construct a quadratic form represented by the H matrix and the B vector, and this is done by linearizing the error uh, function around the current optimum, X star, and uh, uh, by assembling the linear system H and B. A crucial aspect uh, in this slide is the solution of the linear system that can be very large dimensional. However, the solution of the linear system would lead us to the, with a perturbation delta X. That if applied to the current solution, would improve potentially the value of the cost function, so which means decreasing it. Luckily, uh, this problem would be not approachable. The, the linear system would not be solved if it would be dense, given the size of the, uh, of the problem itself. But luckily, the structure of the problem comes to our help, because we could observe that the error functions are only affected by uh, the pair, the value of the two variables that they connect. This means that the Jacobian will be non-zero only in correspondence of the block. And this means that uh, once we construct the quadratic form, each error will contribute only with one single non-diagonal component. Uh, normally we have a number of edges which is proportional to the number of nodes given the structure of the slum problem, and this will lead to a system which is definitely sparse and can be actually solved with modern slum systems, such as with modern linear solvers such as CSPARS or uh, Cholmont. And with this uh, I conclude my part and I leave you to Sir. In the first part, Wolfram introduced the idea of pose graphs and how to use pose graphs for um, modeling the SLAM problem. In the second part, Giorgio told you on how to um, use the ideas of least squares in order to minimize the errors introduced by these constraints. And I will talk now about how to use robust kernels in order to be more robust with respect to errors in our data association. So we start with the observation that data associations are tricky to do, and thus we will make mistakes in the long run. We simply can't prevent that. So the question is, how can we deal with outliers and gross errors that we are doing when we are building up the slam graph? Basically, if we are adding wrong loop clause constraints, for example. And so the key idea in here is to not rely completely on the least squares formulation, but modify the least squares formulation a bit in order to be less sensitive with respect to mistakes that we are doing. And the key idea is to change the squared error function that Giorgio was introducing in the previous video and replace this squared term by a so-called robust kernel. It's basically a function which changes the shape from a quadratic function to a differently shaped function. So you can see here on that um, plot differently colored functions. And the purple one is actually the squared function, the parabola, the standard least square solution. And if we choose a differently shaped function, such as the Cauchy function shown in blue over here, or the Huber um, shown in um, green, we can see that the effect of constraints which have a large error, that means they are further away from zero on the x-axis, is lower compared to the quadratic error function. 
And the key idea is that we can basically choose one of those robust kernels, which basically means if we are close to a zero error configuration, we basically have a least squares problem. And if we are far away, we are in a problem where the effect of those um, bad constraints or wrong constraints is substantially downweighted. And the key insight in here is, is that these robust kernels can um, be used as a, as a weighted least squares problem. That means we don't need to change the math behind it. We can use a different function than the squared error function. The only thing we need to do, we need to add an additional weight to the minimization term. So if we commit on one kernel, let's say the Huber kernel here shown in green, then we have to pick a specific weight shown on the right hand side in this graph and select the weight value and downweigh that constraint if it has a large error configuration. So the purple horizontal line at one means the weight equals to one. In this case, we are in the standard least square setting and we don't need to add an additional weight to one of our constraints. But if you choose or commit on a different kernel, then we will have to add an additional weight to that. And so we basically select a kernel and then perform the optimization with this kernel in order to reduce the effect of outliers in our data cessation. We can even go a step further and use a different type of function, which is basically a family of those kernels, shown here in this equation, where we have an additional parameter alpha. And depending on the value of alpha, we're basically changing the shape of these kernels. So in situations where we have high outliers, we may take a very low value for alpha. And in situations where we're extremely certain about what's going on, we set alpha to 2, because then we are um, in the least squares um, approach. And we can basically turn the optimization problem of finding the best configuration, minimizing the error, as minimizing the error and at the same point in time, selecting the correct kernel for our situation. So I brought you an example to illustrate this effect here. You see a vehicle driving over a highway, another car is overtaking that vehicle. And then it's very likely there are not many features around that the registration system may hook to the wrong car. And shown here on the left is actually the result with the Huber loss. Um, where the car committed on the wrong data cessation compared to the adaptive loss on the right hand side where everything looks good. It may be a bit hard to see from those images and therefore I brought you a video illustrating this. So first we show the result with a fixed kernel such as Uber. We see the car overtaking and very soon we'll make a data cessation mistake and we are simply committing to the wrong data cessation hypothesis which we see now and we will end up with a wrong map of the environment. If in contrast to this, we use an adaptive kernel where you see the alpha value here on the top left being adapted to the current situation. As soon as the car overtakes, we are changing into a mode with a strong outlier rejection technique here shown with alpha equals to minus 10, but then we're able to build a correct map of the environment. This is the work done by Nivet Chabrulu showing how to use those kernels in the context of the SLAM problem. We can then use these ideas, the post graph, the least square error minimization, and those robust kernels, so all the elements shown here within these three lectures and integrate them into a SLAM system. One example for this is SUMA by um, Jens Belay, um, which is a LIDAR-based SLAM system, which is used, for example, in autonomous driving applications, building a map of the environment, building up a post graph, finding loop closures, registering those um, different parts of the environment, performing the optimization, taking into account a robust kernel in order to come up with an appropriate map of the environment. And this is a system that you can build if you integrate the techniques that we have been presenting here into a single system. If you want to dive a bit deeper into a SLAM and graph-based SLAM, I also brought you some recommendations on what to read. There's our tutorial on graph-based SLAM, also related to this video material here, which is probably the starting point for most of the activities. Then there's a Springer Handbook on Robotics, which gives you a very good overview. And if you then want to dive deeper, the Probabilistic Robotics book is the place to look into, at least as your starting point for further investigations. And with this, I'm coming to the end of these three lecture series on the simultaneous localization mapping problem. Wolfram introduced the post graph with states um, as nodes and edges as constraints. Then Giorgio introduced the least squares problem on how to minimize the error introduced by these constraints. We have seen that data stations are tricky to do and therefore we need to have a way for dealing with wrong outliers or wrong constraints such as outliers. And these are the robust kernels that I've introduced here as a way for dealing with gross errors and outliers and still being able to build a good map of the environment. So I hope you enjoyed this video series and thank you very much for your attention.